us today. And Lord, just fill it with your anointing. Be with all of us, Lord God, as we go through our trials and tribulations. Lord, there's so many that need the healing today, Lord. Lord, just a lifting up. God, I pray that that's here today. Lord, I pray for those that are struggling, whether they be here at the church or online or wherever, or family members, God be with them. Lord, comfort those that are grieving. But today, our main goal here is to preach the gospel. Your gospel, Lord God, not of ours. Please keep it plain. Guide me, take control of me, Lord God. Just let me do what you would have me to do. Lord, this morning I'm in need. I'm in need of the Holy Spirit. Just take control of this service. And Lord, that you just take control of everybody here, that we might lift you up. Lord God, that we may hear your praises, Lord. But not just that, that we might be able to hear your word and retain it and apply it in everyday life. We love you and thank you for all that you do and for what you're about to do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I'm going to side note for just a second. For those of you that have started coming and became regular, I love you guys. I'm so proud. You know what y'all have been here for a long, long time. But God knew who he was sending and how he was sending the right people at the right time. I'm so proud of that because I'll be honest with you, with some of the sickness and things we've had on, we just wouldn't have had nobody here in the church. Not just that guy. It's a different guy. Uh, an additional breed of people that's come to church that are on fire for the Lord, that love the Lord, and uh, not to say that they had before, but these are fresh fires because these people haven't been in church for a while. Um, I, some of them haven't been ever to church ever at all before, so I'm really blessed with that. But um, today I was thinking about the life that God gave us and everything's come together. As a matter of fact, me and somebody was talking about you the other day, Chris, and some things came through. Just to be in God's house and the ability to come here and do this, regardless of who's here, regardless of what's going on. Um, and I know that, uh, man, we've come through some times, and I'm sure everybody here has went through times in their life. And um, there comes a time in our life physically that if we live long enough, we're going to slow down. Most of us know that. Most, some of us know it too well. And the older you get, it seems like the more you slow down. But I wonder sometimes if that's not just a figment of our imagination. But I was watching something the other day, and I was on YouTube, and I, I was I was flipping through, and I saw these old men. They were in their 80s, and some were in their 90s. And it was in Asia. I don't know exactly where. I know they wasn't in Langdale. So as I got to watching, these young, these older guys were up there doing pull-ups. I was doing in my 20s, and I'm not talking about just pull-ups. This old cuss was up there doing pull-ups, and all of a sudden he just throws one hand behind his back and starts doing pull-ups like that. And I thought, well, that's one special guy. And all of a sudden I got looking, and a load of them grandpas came in and started doing these pull-ups, and I was watching them, and I was just, number one, I was ashamed. Number two, I was, I was blown away because most of us by our 40s or 50s, we, we get a visit by Arthur. You know, and once Arthur comes in, it changed everything. Arthur, I was terrible. He gets in every part of the joints of your body and everything else, got back, cross, got a leg across here. These old men just going at it, tearing it up. One of the main things I noticed is they was not fat. I'm sure that had something to do with it. They were really light, but still to be able to jump up there and do those pull-ups like that was unbelievable. And I mean, they were out doing, and this wasn't just in Asia. I saw one guy, one older guy, in, uh, on Muscle Beach out there. He was out doing the, uh, you know, the younger guys. He had to be every bit of 80s. Uh, of 80 something, you know, when he's out there doing that. So I got, I got to wonder, you know, me and uh, another individual had a discussion the other day, of, and it was a good discussion about Philippians 4.13. Uh, everybody know what Philippians 4.13 is? We do all things through Christ's strength. And I didn't even know we were going there this morning, but it just laid in my heart, and we are going there this morning. So, but on this scripture that says we can do all things through Christ, there's a lot of folks that teach it a different way. They might have to believe it or not. Even though it says one thing, there are folks that teach it so many different ways. I do believe that it's literal and it's here today. Some uh, some Baptist preachers preach that, that was, that's not applicable to today, that that was in the old days, that that didn't apply now because when Paul was speaking, he was speaking in past tense. Paul was speaking in past tense. They didn't do it today. All through the scriptures, there's scripture that speaks in past tense. It doesn't mean that it wasn't a statement talking about what we can do now. But as I got to breaking it down and the individual that shared this to me and we got to talking about it, I got digging into it and I found something that I probably should have seen a long time ago. How many of y'all are familiar with the scripture that says, and I know y'all heard me talk about it before, that says that we can drink any poisonous thing or handle any venomous snake and all that? 
Yeah. So you know what that's an impl you know the implication to that is, right? The implication to that is is if I if God has sent me on a mission to go in that closet to bring out the word and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'll tell you how this is the explanation to it. If God has put me on a mission to go into that closet and pull out the stone tablets that he had laid out for us to do today, and I was going to do that, nothing, and, and I had agreed to what God had called me to do, the angels would be there to protect me, and nothing could stop me on the way to that closet if I was on a mission from God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in this case, I absolutely can do all things as long as I'm on this mission laid out by God. Now, I mean to prove that because it was not ever laid out to be just willy-nilly. Uh, it wasn't just so I could say, I'm going to step up and play the piano like Michael because God told me to unless God had anointed me and laid it in there for me to be able to do it. See, I'm not going to stand up. And this is where we get tied up into things. We get tied up into the glorification of ourselves. That scripture was never to glorify others. This scripture was to glorify God. How do we know that? Because the scripture tells us this. That if we pay and pray and ask, we can do all things, but it's for the, what? For the, for the glorification of the Father and the Son. For those two. So we, we can take these scriptures and have the understanding that I believe that I've got biblical proof here that yes, Philippians 4.13 is applicable for today. And I believe, here's what I don't believe. I believe that if you use Philippians 4.13 to sell t-shirts, and that's what you're saying, the Lord will help me sell all these t-shirts because... I'm using Philippians 4.13. It's wrong. Let me tell you why. This is done for the glorification of the word of God. I believe and I only can use myself. That's why I was able to preach when I was struggling and couldn't breathe hardly. When I was able to preach. That's why Brother Ernest, when he came through here, when he was literally just had a stroke and came through and sat down there and was able to get up and sing and come to church. That's why when Don and me got issues or other folks here got issues and you come through, you're able to do the things that you're able to do. If you believe and you focus and I say, this is my mission, if it is a call. And see, I'm telling you, regardless of what anybody else believes, I was called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that being said, I wasn't, I didn't wake up one day and said, I'm going to seminary. And I, there's, listen to what I'm saying, though, because there's nothing wrong with going to seminary. Through callings. I believe this is where it comes. So if I'm called, and God has called me, and God has anointed me, and he's laid it for this to be my mission, I don't know why every time I think of this, and y'all pray for me, I think about the Blues Brothers. And if that part of the movie, when they say they're on a mission from God, y'all know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> bad as I hate to say this, if you see the things that they do in that movie, and I ain't seen it in years, so if it's a bad movie, it probably is, but I don't remember, but it's been 20-something years since I said 30 years probably since I've seen it. But through that movie, I remember seeing that on this mission from God, they did many miraculous things. The things that they did were, were actually amazing because they were on this mission that they believed from God. Now, I don't believe their mission was a mission from God, but I can tell you, I believe that there's people out there that have a mission from God to do things that God has called you to do. And I believe they're in this church. Matter of fact, I believe there's some in this room that God has called you to do, but that they able to take advantage of Philippians 4.13. Number one, you've got to step out and do it. There's a song that says you've got to reach out and claim it for you're standing on holy ground. How many of y'all believe that this morning? How many of y'all believe if you claim it, you believe it? In the name of Jesus. Now, there, I'm going to get into boxing for just a minute and talk about it for one minute. That there's a person named Deontay Wilder, if any of y'all heard of. He used to say this thing, speak it, believe it, receive it. That was his say. That's pretty close to what he said. Wouldn't speak it, believe it, receive it. He would tell himself this. But he was missing a major component from that. God. I can tell you I'm a duck. I can believe I'm a duck and walk around and quack like a duck. And in most cases, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. I ain't never going to be no duck. And nobody's ever going gonna, to uh, gonna look and say, hey, I thought you was a duck. Ain't going to happen. Unless it was God's will for me to be a duck, and then I'd be just as quacky as I needed to be. And I believe that. I believe in the scriptures that says I can move mountains with my faith is strong enough. But I believe I've got to be in a mission. I believe that mission needs to be the glorification of God. And I don't believe it needs to be my mission. I believe it needs to be God's mission. And as you're in the church today, if I had it, and I believe that God can build this church up, but if it's not his will, think about what I'm saying. If I tell you that God can build this church again and be what it was at one time, 
and it's not God's will. He's got a reason for it being this way. It ain't going to happen, even if I believe it. But if God says, Derek, if you step up and you do what I've told you to do, the doors will be and it'll happen. As long as I'm obedient and I follow him. If we go back to see the things that happen scripturally, to see what happened uh, in the scriptures, and every time somebody was healed, Jesus would tell them to do what? One, he'd tell them, go and sin no more many times, right? And then he'd say, come and follow me. What he tell the rich and the man? Go and follow me. Now, following Jesus means that you're walking toward those footsteps. I'd like to say walking in those footsteps, but it's harder than what it seems like. I try so hard. Mr. John, I'm telling you, I try so hard. I try to walk in the, in the footsteps of Jesus. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes I slide and slip all over the place. And I get ashamed of myself. Because the more I do, it seems like sometimes the further I slide away. But I think what makes a difference, brother, for me and the rest of the world, I believe it's this. I believe the fact that I get up, dust myself back off, and I go back and I head forward. See, <clears throat> I might be able to do all things, but that doesn't mean on that way that it's going to be, that I'm going to be perfect and I'm not going to make mistakes. Because Lord knows I've made them. There's a pastor. Sometimes I don't have the faith, and I believe it requires faith. I believe you've got to have the faith to step up. But through this, as I look around, I see these older people, and they're doing the things that, that they've got their focus to do. But there's also folks that are laying in bed at that age that are struggling. Well, through this, I know that I can tell one thing by watching them. I can tell they never stopped working toward the goal that they were heading out to. Those men didn't just do that. They worked their whole life toward this. They've been doing this their whole life. These guys have been working out their whole life. It was part of their life. For you to do something and be successful, and be a child of God, and be successful, you've got to make serving God your life. I believe if you speak it, believe it, receive it, that it can happen, but you've got to put God first and you've got to do the works because faith without works is dead. Going back to boxing, and I hate to throw this out, some of y'all care less about it, but one thing about Deontay Wilder is they said he just wouldn't do what he was told to do. They, they tried to train him to jab. He didn't want to jab, and they said, matter of fact, his old trainer said that when he stepped up and he would, he, they would tell him it's time to jab, but if he, he, was, he didn't got so stuck on himself that if he didn't want to jab, he just wouldn't jab. So he was left with, he was a one, well, I won't say one trick pony because he was a pretty good boxer, but he had one massive trick that he thought that if all things fail, I ain't got to do anything else because I can fall back on this. This is where Christians look a lot like him. Because we think that if, you know, we, why should we have to do anything? Because we got one thing that we can fall back on. Y'all know who that is? Jesus. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says faith, with faith without works is dead. So the Bible says we can't just step up and fall into it and just step up and say, you know, I'm not going to come and serve you, Lord, because I know you'll get me out. Back in Romans 6, 7, 8, it goes into to paint a picture. It's a beautiful picture because it talks about sin and receiving sin. And there's so many people that say I'm saved. And one part I love of that is where it says, it goes, if you, if you tie it in together, it says this. It says that it pleasures God to forgive you of sin. As a matter of fact, what the Bible says, that the heavens rejoice over one repentance and and that it pleasures God to forgive you from sin. So you've got some folks say, since it pleasures God, I'm going to give him, that's what these scriptures come out to say, that if it pleasures God, I'm going to give him plenty of pleasure, I'm going to sin all along. These are Christians, or who call themselves Christians, walk and talk and seem like Christians. And not the way it is. It is a, I would much rather, matter of fact, doesn't the Bible talk about that, uh, that, that the better person is the one who says, Lord, forgive me, I'm just a sinner than the, the Pharisee that stands on the sidewalk arrayed in fine garments, saying loud prayers to be seen with men. He talks about how much he tithes and you know how he prays all this time and how he fasts. And here's this, here's this old uh, publican sitting over to the side. And God bless him. He's over there telling everybody, to, you know, open it so ashamed, but in his heart he opens it up and says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And they say that this was the man who was justified more than the religious person. Why? Because he was genuine, he meant it, and he cried out to God, and he believed it with all his heart. He did what God asked him to do at that point, and that was repent. And let me tell you something. It reminds me of this little guy. 
who had heard about Jesus. I love this story. And he heard that Jesus was coming through his town that day, and he was fairly excited. He was a scam booker boy. He had done a lot of bad things. He had stolen from a bunch of people. Of course, he had legally stolen, but stolen nevertheless. See, his job, I would like to say tax collector, but he was not technically a tax collector. He was under Jewish authority, so he couldn't technically be a tax collector. What he was was under the tax collector, called by the Roman Empire, so he wasn't bound by any law, so he would... He would collect the Roman taxes and then he could take whatever he wanted for himself because he was under Roman authority so he had stolen and raped and plundered, plundered and all this stuff but he heard about this man named Jesus and it got all over him and he was a little old bitty fellow and then he could see the crowd and he knew Jesus was in that crowd and he was going to do whatever he had to do to see Jesus and he saw this sycamore tree but when he saw that tree he decided, I'm, you know what, I'm going to climb that tree and I'm going to see this Jesus. And everybody there, all the Jews, thought he was a terrible, horrible person. You know why? Because he was. But that terrible, horrible person made his way up that tree. He didn't let anything stop him from seeing his Jesus that day. And with all the people and all the crowds that were around him, Jesus looked up and saw him. He said, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. Because today I'm going to be with you, brother. I don't know why that gets me emotional. Because he was a scam booger. He was rough. He had stolen everything else. And, and all the murmuring church people, and we're just using this today instead of saying Pharisees and scribes and religious folks. But all the church people in that, that looked and said, Can you believe he's called this? Can you believe this is the kind of person that Jesus wants to eat with and hang out with? And this is the man you go, Yes, thank God that Jesus wants to hang out with people like we are. Thank God that he wants us to be in church. And I pray that this church never gets to be like those that come in and say, what are they doing here? But on that flip note, I'm going to tell you what, I can see 100% how people can say that about me, how I was. 100% see it. I see how the world could see me the way I used to be. I could see it because of the things that I did. And I didn't understand that it took looking through the eyes of a friend to actually see how people could see me. And I always said I saw how people could see me a certain way. But, you know, we build ourselves up better than we actually were. Because I did. I built myself up. I said I was something that I wasn't. You know, you look back and I would tell people how bad I was, but in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, I really wasn't that bad. I really was that bad. Some things I did was pretty dead blame bad. The more I think about it, the worse it was. And I made a mockery of God. I used God and everything else. That's why today I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that God forgave me, and I'm so thankful today that he loves me, and I'm so thankful that no matter what, that I've got a place here with him. So getting back into service and what God laid in my heart, um, <clears throat> these people made a choice. Um, so many of you made a choice to come and follow Jesus and to step up and do what, what you feel like you need to do in his service. But through this, I, I want to ask y'all something today. I, I'm, I'm, this is something that's kind of off course a little bit, but I want to ask y'all to pray for me. Because last time I asked y'all to pray for me to lose weight and pray, and I started losing weight. So pray for that again. But I pray for you to, get, to help me get back in shape. And I'm going to tell you why. And we'll get into this in just a minute. Because I want to be able to do more in the service of God. I want to be able to do the things that I could do before. And that being said, what am I going to be able to do this? Well, I'm going to have to step up and I'm going to have to believe and I'm going to have to focus, but it's going to require work. Now, Romans 12, 12 says it's rejoicing in hope, patience, and tribulations, continuing in instant in prayer. Rejoicing in hope, patience, and tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Rejoicing in hope. You know, sometimes when things start going good and things are going great, we forget about God. We might thank him in the beginning, but we get to the point where when things are going good, and that happens throughout history when the Jewish people begin to have everything they could ever imagine, they turned their back on God and fell, fell toward false gods. These false gods that could give them the things they wanted. Next part, patience and tribulations. When things go bad, so many people say, how could God do this to me? I hate this thing. just makes me sick. How could God do this to me? Because I've been coming to church and I've been doing this. And that's the most ignorant statement I've ever heard in my life. Like you're doing God a favor. Like you're doing God a favor by coming to church. God's doing us a favor. We're not a pile of... Dust on the ground. Y'all just don't know about some Old Testament justice. 
So through this, I'm thankful to be here today. But folks, think that way. You know why? Because the dead lane's full. Continuing instant in prayer. God, you know, sometimes when God lays it in my heart, I drop down and pray. I don't care where I'm at. And I've done it my whole life. Even when I was lost, I don't know what good it done me, but when I was lost, I remember times in the car bed, God laid it in my heart, and I'd fall down, and I'd pray right in front of folks, because when God lays it in your heart, you better do it, even though I was still slipping during that time. But um, <clears throat> I wouldn't get by day by day without prayer. Y'all live off prayer. If you don't, let me tell you something. What a good way to live. When you're going through your trials and tribulations, I say I live off prayer, but how many times a day have I forgot to say my prayer before I ate? Before I went to bed. Anybody ever struggle with that? And you have to catch yourself in the middle of it and you're right almost asleep, and wake up, say, Oh Lord, I'm so sorry. Or be in the middle of your Captain Crunch and stop and say, Lord, help me. You know? But through this, you know what that means? That means that we've all slipped, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all got these issues. But um the thing about it is as Christians, we got to slow down and realize that Jesus needs to be the focus. We all want what we want, don't we? Everybody in this church wants what we want. And I, said, I thought about work today and how folks work and work and work to get the things that they want. We all seek the things that we want that brings pleasure to us. So we all want to go out and do things that makes us happy and do things that make us happy. But the problem with that is the body will lead you to the things of the world. Not things that you need, but the things of the world. So we follow this through and, and because I'm going to tell you, I don't know what y'all like. Some of y'all might like fishing. Some of y'all may not like, but some of y'all may like football or, you know, whatever you got that you like. And the simple thing is, it's wonderful to have hobbies and things that you love, but when it appears to you and God, it's so dangerous. I've watched folks fall out of church because they had a hobby that they loved so much that it kept them away from God. And time after time, I began to see these, some of these people had prayed and said, I want my, I want my spouse to come to church. Pastor, what can I do to get my spouse to come to church? I said, first off, you've got to pray for them. And second, you need to be an example for them. Because if they see Jesus in you, they either want two things, and I'm going to be straight with you. They're either going to want it, or they're going to get away from it. And I hate to say it, but it's the truth. And i got a feeling if that person loves you enough, they'll see Jesus in you, and they'll change it. It happens. How many times have we seen it? We've seen it here before, haven't we? And so through this, these people will ask, but they're not willing to do the things required of them to have God work the things that they work in their household. When you ask Jesus into your heart, guys, you become part of him. The moment you get saved, you're supposed to be part of him. He is supposed to be the top everything in your life. He's supposed to come before everything. And I've had ladies ask before, said, Pastor, how can I say that Jesus comes before my children? And I said, that's an easy one, because without him, you wouldn't have your children. Isn't that right? So Lord, how can they come before my family? Because without him, you wouldn't have your family. How many folks walk around they don't have no family? How many folks homeless on the street don't have no home? You know, um, I think of that Michael Combs song that says, you know, I've got a house to keep me warm and to shelter me from the storm. I am one blessed man. He says, um, he says, I got a wife that holds me tight and keeps me warm at night. I'm a warm, I, boy, I'm one blessed man. What a wonderful song. And I think about it, and I think about um, you know, the next part where he talks about he's got Jesus in his heart. He knows he won't depart. And think about this thing. You think of how blessed we are. When we sit around and moan and grumble and grind our mind, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the Israelites. You know, no matter what we get, no matter what is not good enough for us, we can't be happy. But I'm going to tell you how you find happiness in your life and make Jesus the focus of your life. Because if you make Jesus the focus of your life, you're not going to get heartbroken when you turn down for that car. You understand that maybe you couldn't afford it anyway. That many times that some of us went to car business, we've seen people roll out there with cars they couldn't afford. And that don't bring up this pleasure in your life. You got to the car business and you sell a car, I'm going to sell a house or anything else, and you buy something you can't afford. What do you have to do? You've got to struggle to make them payments. What does that usually mean? That means you've got to work more. When you work more, what do you use to sacrifice? You're usually working on what? Saturdays and Sundays. When you work on Saturdays and Sundays, what happens? You find out you wind up losing your way to the Lord, or you wind up working like losing your windies, wherever you do. And through this, through the things that we do, we lose our walk with God. Isn't it crazy the things this world takes away from God? But it does. How many folks sit down and love that computer so much that they have a hard time breaking away from it on Sunday morning? And then I tell you, play video games. It's so hard to break away from that video game, you can't hardly come to church because of it. How many folks watch TV? I don't know how many of them do have this, but TV's not the main thing anymore. How many folks watch TV and they just don't want to watch, leave them because they watch watching something and they into it? Come to, but that's what I'm trying to say. How many folks got up in the morning and thought, man, it's such a pretty day, it's cool, I'm going to go crabby fishing. 
a crappy way. And I guarantee you, you'll be a whole lot happier if you do God's work first. Because I'm a firm believer. You know what? I think about what the scriptures say about the Sabbath. And I believe we ought, y'all all believe we ought to keep the Sabbath holy. And I'll explain to y'all if y'all ever ask one day why we, why we use Sunday as our Sabbath. Because Sabbath is actually, was actually sundown Friday and sundown Saturday. So having this understanding on Sunday, why do we, we keep this as our Sabbath? And I don't really think today is that if what we use this Sunday, and so as we take this as our Sabbath, there's a lot of folks that says, I don't think you should fish on Sunday. I, think, I don't care what you do as long as you're out there bringing praise, honor, and glory to God first. You give this day to him, and you do the things you ought to do, and what you do in between, I don't think God cares. I think if we step up and we do God's work and we do the things we're supposed to do, I think that God will bless us. In Psalms 119, 105, it says this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The truth and the truth comes from the knowledge and the reading of God's word. So if I need to know what I need to do to be a better Christian, I need to get in God's word. I need to hear the word of God. And this is what I realized, that sin is referred to as the flesh because I studied the Bible. So isn't it the flesh that leads us to the thing? It is the flesh that actually leads us to sin. Understand what I'm saying? It's the things that we desire of the flesh, whether it be adultery, whether it be the computer, whether it be fishing. It's the things that you have to fight up in yourself. First John 2, 16 and 17 says this, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of the life, is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. Here's the thing. I want to live my best life right now. I want this, from the moment I accepted Jesus Christ, I want this to start to be my best life today. Some folks look back at being young as the good old days. So many folks think about the things we did when we was young as the good old days. And I thought, see, I had some good times when I was younger. But I was foolish, and I was ignorant. If I'd have died, I'd have went to hell. And, I, you know, I wish I would have done things different in the young days, but I can't change that. But these are the days that are going to build what I do for the rest of my life. I know it's hard to grasp this today, and I know everybody's got everything going. I know you're tired, but this is a point I want you to understand today. If you can hear anything I say, I want you to listen to this point, because the rest of the service ain't going to mean nothing without it. I know you're busy, but just give me one minute and I'll say it more than once, I promise you. What you do from this day forward, from this very day forward, is going to determine what life you're going to have in heaven. What you do today, this very day, where you start laying your treasures up in heaven, is because you know what? Maybe before you wouldn't do it. I know a lot of us are not doing it, but we set up today and we put our purpose. If we put off the things of this world, and we receive the heaven, because I'm going to say this about three times. If we put all the things of the world and we receive the heaven, if we put all the things of the world and we receive the heaven, what does that mean? That means if we stop lusting after the things of this world and we seek and desire the things of Jesus, we begin to build treasures in heaven. And why is that important? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are important. Number one, <clears throat> What are you living for now? You are working for what you want. Working for number one. I've said it many times. So who are you looking out for? I'm looking out for number one. Who's number one in your life? Right. right? It should be Jesus, but who do they say number one is? Yourself. Why? Because we're selfish, hard-headed individuals. If I'm looking out for number one, I'm looking out for Jesus. If I'm honest with myself. If I'm a Christian. Who's this supposed to be above all in your life? Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to hold the Trinity. That's what we're supposed to be looking out for. And if you're looking out for number one, looking out for Jesus. So I ask you something in your life. Who are you looking out for? Number one, you or number one, Jesus? Because somebody, you, let me promise you something. You can't look out for who's number one, you and who's number one, Jesus. You can't do two. You can't serve two masters, the Bible says. So you can't look out for who's best for you and who's best for Jesus. So you've got to ask yourself that. Who are you looking out for? Nine times out of ten. I'm going to say nine point nine 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 times out of ten. We're looking out for us. And we do. That's right. But it's not the proper thing. You're right. Jesus said, if you put anything before me, you're not worthy of me. That's where the mamas and the daddies have the hardest time, and I get it. 
But when you look at that child, if you look at your spouse, if you look at whoever it is, you need to realize that you're looking at the reflection of the face of God according to the scriptures. So when you look at that child, you've got to realize that that's the face of God looking back at you. And through that, you can understand that I bring my praise on and glory to God because God is the one that gave me whatever I'm looking at. Because the Bible says, how many things were created by him? All things. Not some things. All things. All things created by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. So that means your children. That means your spouse. That means your home. That means your cars. Everything you got. So in essence, if you want to give that love to your children, let them see that love for the father. Let them see that love for the son. Because that's what's, world, that's what's wrong with the world today, too. There's too many daddies absent, too many mamas absent. But if you put Jesus in that place, I promise you he can heal all that. See, what is the problem? We say what's wrong with the world today. We call it racism. We call it everything else. But I'll be honest with you. The problem, what's wrong with the world today is the absence of a strong family value in life. Yeah. So whatever's missing, who can fix that? See, we don't have to tell you. I'm preaching what we, you already know. And people say, well, I already knew that. Why? Because we don't apply it. We might have to preach this 10 times or 20 times. I preach it how we got to preach it. So remember, maybe every Sunday we come in and say, remember, Jesus is first, the church is missed. <laughs> yeah, really? I mean, let's look at this. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Give me just a second. I want you to look at it for just a second. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where three thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break in through or steal. For where your treasures is, there will your heart be also. That is the key. Whether you realize what I've been talking about this whole time, that is the key. So where your treasures are, that's where your heart is. So if you're looking out for number one and number one is you, your heart is for yourself. But if you're looking out for number one and number one is God, then God is your focus in everything. So what does that mean? That means we've got to find a way to make sure God comes for all things because we're too busy thinking about ourselves. But what's part of the problem? There's so many preachers today preaching prosperity in the world. Y'all know what that means, prosperity in the world, that you will receive the things of this world. The Bible says that you can have the desires of your heart, and that's true. That is true. But where they get you at is the desires of your heart of the child of God is the desire to please Jesus. Not a new car. Not a new house. Not the best clothes. Not the fanciest suits. What is the thing? What should be the desire? And let me just ask you an honest question. What should the desires of a Christian's heart be? Jesus. That's so simple. But we moan and gripe and complain that what we got is not good enough. Poor, pitiful us. I just stood here today and told you a list of what's going on, but I'm grateful to be here today. You know what I went through last night? That's all that matters. As I'm back to this through this, I know that my main focus today was to get up here and to bring praise, honor, and glory to God and to love Him. But even still, I fall short. But what does repentance mean? That doesn't mean that I'm doing everything right all the time. That means I'm making a conscious effort to be forgiven and to try to do what I can do to serve God. And I fall short sometimes, but I've repented in my heart and God will help me lead the way. So what does that mean? That when I slip and I fall, that God has His hand right there and I don't reject Him. I pick it up and He picks me up. Is that right? Yes. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. Y'all remember that song? I can sing it, but I can't. I'm too hoarse right now. But the simple fact is, you get the point. So, through this and grasping this, I am so thankful that when I fall, I've got somebody to lift me up. But it's hard to do it, ain't it? But what does Jesus say? He said, Bring those things to me because it is hard to do. Your load is heavy. He said, bring your load to me, and, and this is going to be so important. He said, bring your load to me, and I'll help you make it lighter. What do you mean by bring your load to me? I think to do that, we've got to understand the scriptures and what it says. The Bible tells us in his word, let's see what it says. He said, bring your load to me. Bring your burden to me. 
Well, let's just do it. I mean, I'm pulling it up. I could give, I'll give you some scriptures in just a minute. Number one, the Bible says you need a preacher. How can they hear without a preacher? Right? The Bible says, number two, that not only that, that we need to hear the word of God, but you need to be there. You need to be a part of it. You need to be there. Why is this so important? Because sometimes, because we can read the Bible and we can pray. Now, I want you to understand. Please hear what I'm fixing to tell you. Do not put your faith in me or any man. You can trust me as the pastor and believe that I'm God called. And you should do that or you shouldn't be under this ministry. You should believe that what I believe is in my heart is right or I wouldn't do it. If you don't have a pastor that you think is preaching, what you believe is right. But Paul made it clear when he said that, you know, there's the same God but different administration, so men see it differently. So sometimes I make mistakes. Still put your faith in God. But you've got to understand that there's an anointing of the Holy Spirit that, that, that abides here in this church. And you better believe there was a reason why he told Moses to remove the shoes from his feet because the place he was standing was holy ground. We don't treat it like it. Lord, I'm fixing to make some mads, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Welcome to my world. Because it's specific. And I won't say, I came in one day and there was some dogs in the church. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Let me put it this way. If you come in... And you've got this sweet little animal God blessed you with. He's a tiny little thing about this big. You bring it. I mean, kids do that. Sometimes parents do this, that, and the other. But they don't let them run all over the chapel. I came in. I was walking in the back. And I opened up the door. And two dogs grappled, started growling and biting me. I was as mad as a human being could possibly at that time. Because I realized we do things. And I know we're a little different, especially when it comes to church, this, that, and the other. But this is God's house. Amen. I don't mind if you bring something to drink. What upsets me, and I don't mind if you bring candy. What upsets me is when you start sticking that candy paper in between the seats. I'm getting into something totally different. Yeah. I ain't never been one of them thought that you couldn't. Uh, I remember what David did in the temple and the showbread and all this stuff. Won't go into all this. So I don't. If you're hungry, you got something you feel like you need to bring. Don't drop crumb, crumbs all over the place. If it is, go back down to get that quicker cook up. Take it before you get through. But the simple fact is. We, but that, and you say, what does that got? It's got everything to do with this service. We don't take God seriously. We, don't, we take Him for granted. We don't focus on Him. We don't think about this. We don't realize the people that can be coming to this church and go, hmm, they don't care about it. Must not care much about God. But the simple fact is, if you really thought this was holy ground, we'd make sure one way or another things were done. And I'm not saying that you don't believe it. I'm just saying we, we don't think about it. Do we not? We really. How many times you pull up with them? How many know this? How many times have I got up? I remember one time I was so sick and I came up and there was there was a 12-pack or 24-pack, I don't know how big it was, a uh, beer case of, of just pushed up against the thing. And I literally, that was when I couldn't walk and I came through the first week and it was the first week I'd been back because of the double pneumonia and I had to be on oxygen. I looked at it and I said something about it. I came back that next week and it was still there. So I eased up for what I could walk over there. I had the mom she with me, but I got it and I put it in the back and I told them, I told the people upstairs, I said, please put this up. I came back three weeks later, it was still sitting in the back. But that's the way we do our walk with Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about picking up on the yard. Now this has nothing to do with that, but I'm saying we put him on. We put him, we do, we put him on. Okay, God, we know you're there, so we can do this. We know you'll love us anyway. Don't take God for granted, because one day you're going to meet him. What does the Bible say? I want you to think about what I'm telling you now. He said, he said, many will say, Lord, I prophesied in thy name. I preached, I taught, I beat the drums, I played the guitar. I did all these things. And he'll say, yeah, but you never knew me. You did those things. You came to church, you heard the preaching, but you didn't care enough for me to really take me serious. You didn't know me because if you knew me, you would have loved me. And if you'd have loved me, you would have done for me. I'm going to give you an example. I, don't, I can't look at you here today and tell you who has a true love here or not. But I can tell you that true love means that I'm going to do it for my wife. Here, I don't do it because she thinks she I do it because she tells me to do it. But I do it because I love her. Aggravating my daughter. She asked me to do things. I do it because I love her. I love the boys. I mean, love the babies and I love the boys. The same reason I don't do it because I have to. What they going to do? Beat me up. I ain't gonna do that. Do it because I love. So when he comes to Jesus, think about this while we do it. You should do it because you love him. Not because somebody makes you or, or the folks that love to come through and 
This kills me. Y'all know these people. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They're the same ones that'll be the hundred dollar bill pillars like this. And they do it. You remember, I don't get the hundred dollar bill. What? Why am I saying? But you come through here, right? Those folks that come through and there's some laying on the ground. They're supposed to be like, I sure hate somebody to put this trash on the ground. I guess somebody's gonna pick it up. That's gonna be me. I tell you what, I sure hate that I'm having to pick it up. Y'all know these people like that. They're not doing it for the grace of God. Just but they want you to see that they're doing it. That's so wrong. You know, I know some folks that would bless me. I know, I know a lady who blessed somebody in church one time. They had wrecked their car. The lady paid for a vast majority of their car. I paid for all of it. I can't remember. Several thousand dollars. She made sure nobody knew. You know what I'm talking about, right? Made sure nobody knew. She said, I don't want anybody to hear this, but I'm going to do it. But folks be like, I don't want you to tell anybody, but I'm going to buy Ashley a new car. I'm going to because I love the Lord, but don't tell anybody. I'm buying Ashley a new car. I want to make sure it's quiet and nobody hears me. We do things for the glory of God, to help one another, because Jesus said, when you do unto the least of these, you've done unto me. But when you go ahead and you throw that out there, we was up in Atlanta one time. We was up there and I'm getting a blessing away because you've all done it. So it's not like I'm doing something special. Individual up there and, you know, was homeless and I gave some money and somebody up there was like, why did you give that? They're just going to go get drunk with it. And for the record, they one the guy, I call it. I know that. I just do it. I said, because you know what? God laid it on my heart to do it. Whatever they do with it out there. So who knows? They could have been deep, dire, and need for that out about Believe what you want to believe. This is what I believe. They could have been in withdrawal. Yeah. It could have saved their life. Yeah. You don't know why. And I can tell you this. I don't. My my intention was to give it to them to go get food or to help them. But once I've done it and I gave it to them, that was all of me. Yeah. Ain't none of my business. It's their business. Whatever they do, they'll be judged for it. But here's the deal. Y'all better be careful because some of y'all have turned your nose up at folks. The Bible says be careful because some of you have entertained angels unaware. And church, they don't be doing it in churches. Y'all are talking about folks when they come in. Look at such and such coming in the way they look. What's wrong with folks? I remember the dude that worked with the trash company came in. He said, Pastor, I want to come to church, but I don't want to come in stinking. I said, sit in the back row. Folks don't care. Come on in. If that's far enough. That smell ain't going to come through. Ain't nobody here for you. Just come into church. And nobody got to be involved in that. And they did. They come in. They sit. Nobody complained, nobody fussed, but I guarantee you there was some little lady at one time sitting up in the corner saying, I can't believe they came to, that I know of. I know about that. I know this happened, I'm pretty sure. Somebody said, I can't believe they came to church smell like trash. Praise God they came to church. Exactly. I know we all was thinking this morning, I said, y'all won't be late, but there was a reason why I was late. I ain't trying to tell you why, but it's my own reason why I was late. So let me tell you, you better know I had a good one. But here's the point. What if somebody, now, I ain't being ugly with y'all. Y'all got to wait on me. But if it was somebody else, you don't have to, but it'd be kind of a short service. So, but if it came through and, and it was somebody who came to church, you know, in the middle of it, and, and they're like, Pastor, you know, I think, I'll be honest with you, I didn't ask where Kendra name was because I just assumed they're always here. Well, I just assumed they was going to be late, and that's okay, so it wasn't no big thing. That's why I didn't ask you, may ask for everybody else. So we come to this, I say this for this reason because when they, a lot of folks, so why do we start so late? Believe it or not, y'all may not know this, but we actually have a time. I'll look at Lane. What time is Lane? Do you remember? And what time I always ask you? What time it is? Ten after. Ten after. And then we try to get started shortly after that. And the reason for it, I try to give everybody a grace period so when they come to church, they can be here. I won't focus on You know, I don't have folks come to church and they'll say, well, I was coming to church, but I was going to be late. I didn't want to interrupt the service. I'm like, really? You don't want to interrupt us? You ain't going to interrupt me. I'm just going to keep on preaching. If we're going to keep on going. I would rather you be here and get 10 minutes to know Jesus. No preaching. So that's just the way I am. But, that, but that's the way people are. People have been, and you know, people have made, it is people, I'm, this going to sound terrible, but people that are not devoted to the Lord sometimes or that are confused that cause this. Because they'll talk about what these people do. we got to stop that. You know where I learned that? I learned that by being the person that wore the same t-shirt that was talking about other folks. Even as the preacher. It hit me one day, and I know exactly who I was talking to. I can't exactly remember who I was talking about, but I know the day it hit me. I was sitting in front of, I wasn't talking to Pest Patrol, and I was talking to Mike Moncrief, 
And I, I was in my heart, I was justified by talking to my friend about a problem that was at church, right? So I looked over there, and I was talking about that person. And as I began to talk about that person, I looked, and I could see the disgust in his face. He, he may tell me it wasn't. But I could see the disgust in his face. God allowed me to see the mirror of his soul. And as I saw that, I knew what I was doing was wrong. And I realized even though I thought what I was doing was confiding in a friend, I was really doing that which didn't glorify anything to do with God. Because you can't pray for him first. You don't need to talk about it. We put our faith in so much in this old world. You know, we put our faith in, I was going to show you a dollar bill, but at least I got my last one. We put our faith in, y'all pretend I got a dollar <laughs> We put our faith in money. But you know what money is? Money is a, it is, but it's also a promissory note that ain't worth dealing. Our, our financial system in the United States is based on the gold in Fort Knox. How many of y'all knew that? How many of y'all know that we've got billions in Fort Knox? How many of y'all know we in debt for trillions? So young money, let's be honest, ain't nothing. Matter of fact, what you got is a promissory note of debt. But people die for it. People kill folks over $37 and a pack of cigarettes. Oh. Ain't it? Yeah, I know it. It's the truth. Ain't it true? I mean, it's just the way it is. People are killed for nothing. For this money, for this nothing. And the simple fact is, I know something that's worth more than anything in the world. I've had it. A lot of us here have had it. We've had the cash. I've made the cash. I've done the things I've had for life. For, for a single person, I mean, I wasn't a millionaire, but I could buy just about anything I wanted, had anything I wanted, and had a good job, made plenty of money, you know, had all the, the things that folks would want in the world, and I became the focus, money became my focus. I will come to work on Sundays because I had a key to the used car, and I would sit out through there, and I would wait for folks to come through because, you no, know, it's like money, I like more money. And I was loaning out big money, I was making big money, and I was happy in my mind. But I always had something empty. I wouldn't trade all that in the world for Jesus and my family. Amen. But you know, we lie to ourselves. We say we're making this for our family. We ain't making it for our family. But we're the ones that spend it. We make buy some stuff. I remember back when I was younger, when, when I had Amber Nash would come through, and I was, Christmas time was important to me because I would buy them a lot for Christmas. But that didn't replace the many hours that I was away from them. And then later on, I had Austin and Andrew as they came through, and I, I would buy them nice things for Christmas. And I would come home, and they'll tell you today that at least it might, because it'd be late a lot of times, and they'd have to say, you know, go on to bed by the time I walked in the door. Because it was school the next day, and they never got to see me. Because, because what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? Or to lose his family and his soul, right? Because the simple fact is, one thing I can't buy if I had all the money in the world at the time. So I'm going to tell you, so I'm going to tell y'all something. This preacher gets a couple dollars and I can go somewhere and be a part of my family and it don't appear with my service to God, you can call me gone. Ashley came to me the day and she said, Daddy, you got a problem. She said, we got to have some kind of intervention. What's wrong with you? She said, this cruel thing. Yeah. She said, you're on it. <laughs> now look, but you know what? <laughs> Y'all better think it's by the grace, it's by the grace of God that He gave us Lisa. Because the other day, the lady called me and she said, "I'm not lying, not lying." The lady called me the other day and she said, "Derek, I, actually, I, I'll be honest with you, Lynn. I was fussing because of Tracy. I'm gonna be honest with you. She called, she told me she got Tracy his money back. She called me and I said, "Well, Tracy sent me something the other day, and he got twenty five dollars, and uh, and he got uh, a cruise was about twenty five dollars. It's all the thing." I said, "He got." I said, and I'm mad. You'll never get me nothing like that. And she called me and she said, hang on just a minute. Front the Walmart parking lot. Come back. She's like, how about $15? I'm like, now you're talking. She said, but you've got to go October the 23rd. I said, Lisa. She said, no. We have been twice in the last month and people have talked. I said, let them talk. I make my own money. Church ain't paying me. <laughs> no. Can't nobody sit back and say, it's his decision. Uh-uh. Uh, I'm doing this. I'm telling you what. I, I still figured it out. There's two cameras and a police camera. Bam, I'm coming home. What you talking about? We figured it out, you know. But but you know, all joking aside, I, I love I, I love my family. 
And you know what? I love the church. So what did I do when I wanted to go on a cruise with my family to church? I took the family and the church. We raised money. Nobody that didn't want to have to pay for it paid for it and raised their own money to come through. We're going to do it again soon, too. So what does this got to do with anything? That's not my focus, but I'm going to enjoy my family. I'm going to enjoy my church. I'm going to enjoy the love that God gave me. I'm going to enjoy these beautiful days. But it's not going to fill my church. You know what I'm saying? God's going to come first. I'm going to be here Sunday. Good Lord willing, the creeks don't rise. And you know, my goal is to be here Sunday. But praise on the Lord. God loves and lift him up. He is my focus through this. I love that. But you know, it's not that we don't, we're sitting in a room on that ship, right? I don't care about the rest of it. But you know what I like? I like to sit in a room where nobody can call me sometimes and I just spend the time with Lisa. Because you can't do that anywhere. Because I can't not answer the phone when y'all call me. I just can't. But if I'm in the middle of the ocean, y'all can't call me. I ain't getting there. <laughs> and I will, I will always be there for you unless I'm in the middle of the ocean. Huh? Oh, I, yeah, I can do it on. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> but y'all don't give me my secret up. <laughs> but through this, what we do, we put our faith in money. My faith ain't got to do with money, you know. I'm not going to store it up in barns and such. Like I just said, I'm not going to store it up in a little sack <laughs> and gather it up where moth can eat it. No, I'm going to enjoy my life and enjoy my church and be here. And, and you know, I'm putting on thought on tomorrow because I know that my tomorrow's with Jesus. And I don't care about having piles of money. It doesn't matter to me. None of that stuff matters. So where do we find this strength at? Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope, patience, and tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. We heard that before, right? Rejoicing in hope. I'm rejoicing because there's a hope that there's a place. Ain't nobody crying. Because I know a place where ain't nobody crying. Where well, there's no sadness and sorrow. And for every one of you that ever served God truly and was hurt for it, that he shall wipe the tear from your eye. For those of you that ever went hungry because you paid, the, paid your tithes over everything else, that you'll never hunger again. For those of you that went thirsty because you paid your tithes, you'll never thirst. But for that, Jesus said, in my, father, ooh, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Wasn't so I'd have told you. He said, I'm going to prepare a place so that where I am, that's where you can be too. And I had a preacher tell me something one time that's pretty smart that I didn't think about. It's pretty slick. You hear this song, it says, I've got a mansion over the hilltop. So he said, but y'all know what? Y'all know what the truth is? The Bible doesn't say we've got a mansion. He says in my, I guess right, top tenth corner. But through this it says, he says in my father's house there are many mansions. He said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. But no being God, it's going to be a beautiful place. But that being said, no words to say it's been a mansion. But that's how we twist scripture. And it's okay if the song brings you joy. I like the song myself. 100% and it may be a mansion. I don't know that you may have a mansion. But like some of y'all said, like you were just saying, I don't care if it's a top ten in the corner, but I'm going I know I'm going to be happy, and I had somebody that day. This is an unpopular opinion, too, but it's mine. <laughs> somebody talked to me the other day said, you know, I've lost my spouse, and I want to be with them when I leave this world. And I don't think the Bible's going to, I don't think God's going to allow that. I said, that's not what the Scripture says. I said, they were trying to tempt Jesus, and they came to him, and they said this. There was a brother who had a wife, and he died. His brother took the bride, and it goes on about four foot now. We can talk about that many times. He said, and then they died, and she died. Whose wife is it in heaven? He goes on to explain there's no need for procreation in heaven. But that being said, here's what I believe. The Bible says the two shall become what? What? How I many? Did say that they should be two? The two should be two? It says two shall be one flesh. I believe if I cut my arm off, I'm going to have my arm in heaven. And I believe my wife's going to be right beside me. It's my opinion. You have a right to believe whatever you want to. You believe you're going to be alone by yourself. We Somebody else the other day was talking about something. They said, do you believe that we sit down that God's going to tell us all this stuff that we've asked all the time? I said, no, I don't believe that. Because I believe when we make that transformation for 1 Corinthians 15, 
You understand when we're transformed just like that, then I believe with that new celestial body, that new heavenly body at that point in this time, we have to understand it when the Bible says in a twinkling of an eye, bam, just like that, then when we're transformed in that moment, I believe that we'll have the knowledge we'll have. I don't believe there's going to be some whispering. So sit down, let me tell you what's going on. I don't think it said, I believe in that time, we'll, the Bible says we join every kingdom of heaven. I believe that means knowledge comes with it too. I believe I'll understand how God created all things and how he was from the very beginning. If I don't, I'm okay. People said, well, what about Uncle Leroy that's burning in hell? You're going to have such an understanding, even if you love Leroy with all your heart, of the glorification of God and how pure he is and of his love that ain't even going to bother you. You may not understand it, but our way of thinking is going to be so raised in that we're going to understand. We're going to, all we're going to see is the love of God and why it came through. Now, I don't understand that, but I know that it will be that way. Because I can tell you this. When you sit down and you see how many times God forgave you for the sins that you did in your life, and how many times he asked you to come to him, and you said, no, no, Lord, no, no. No, God. How many times he tugged at your heart and said, come to church? And you said, no, no. How many times he pulled at you to come and accept Jesus in your heart? And you said, no, no, no. And you see it down there in your book. And if you're looking in Lamb's Book of Life and it says 3,527,000 times from the time you woke up to the time you went to bed, the last day of your life, I called you. And it took 3,527,000 times for you to accept and you see how God never gave up on you. Because he knew one day you would ask him into your heart. So was it worth the words? Listen to this. We need to listen to the word of God. Hebrews 2. Therefore we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. At least at any time we should let them slip. Let me preach that one real quick. Three more verses. And if God didn't do anything else, we'll go home. I know y'all hungry and your belly's all running. Give me a second. Therefore we ought to give more earnest heed. In other words, y'all, we ought to think about it. Listen to earnest heed. Therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Therefore, we ought to listen more to the things that we hear in God's word. At least at any time we should let them slip. Here's the deal. How many times have people heard it in the church and I've been preaching? They're like, yep, amen. Hallelujah. Walk outside and exactly what we were amen about, we live it outside. Exactly what we talked about then, we change over time and time and time and time and time again. I have preached it and heard people say amen, and then they'd be like, well, such and such, I heard it, but I finally got it. I'm just grateful you got it. But here's the thing, we need to listen to the things that we've heard. Not just listen, we need to be able to study. For if the word spoken by angel was steadfast, and every transgression disobedient received a recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect, neglect, so great salvation, which the first time begun to the spoken by the Lord was confirmed unto us by them that heard. So if we neglect, this, oh, I love Hebrews. Hebrews is a scary book, though. So if we neglect the salvation that God has given us, who neglects it? Nearly every human being that ever was on the face of the earth would neglect salvation. Nearly every human being neglects salvation. You know why? I won't say every human being except for Jesus. Do you know why? Because we neglect salvation when we sin. Do you understand that? When we intentionally sin. How many of y'all sit here and say you ain't never intentionally sinned since you became a Christian? Boy, y'all been, I ain't taking no lightning strikes in the church. You knew it was a sin while you was doing it. You knew it was a sin after you'd done it. Have one time I tell you this last little, little story. When I was learning, when I was in training to be a pastor, I came in and that week I lied about something. I have no thought of what I lied about. I don't remember what it was. I wish I could tell you. And I was preaching my service, and the preacher was sitting right here. And I stood up and I was telling the church, I said, and I lied this week. The preacher jumped up and he said, well, he didn't mean it. I said, yes, I did. He was mad. Arms crossed, lips out. I'm talking about he was man, he was ready to get me out of service. And I said, Yes, I did. He said, well, I'm sure you guys yes I did. I said, I did lie. And he didn't know it was a lie. Yes, I did know it was a lie. I knew it before I told it. I knew it while I was telling it, after I told it. So why am I telling y'all this? I'm telling you this for this reason. 
Because of that, I became convicted immediately, and it was immediately the conviction that I felt. And when I lied, I felt terrible about it. I felt like you had just scalded me. I felt like I'd been caught doing something I ought not to do, and it was tearing me up. It was eating me up inside, and I was so convicted. I didn't want to lie no more. And I wanted them to hear if somebody was training to be a preacher could do it. You know, we all going to have our issues. So we came through. I told him, I said, even though it was a lie that I told him, that shows the glory of God that he can forgive me and that he can turn this into something I don't want to do anymore. But if we neglect the greatest salvation, if we just keep on living the life we live, and that's what I did. Before I got truly saved and I went to church and I said these prayers, I would come to church. I'd sing in the choir. I'd do all these things, but I'd leave out and live like the devil. You know why I did that? Because I was neglecting that salvation. Y'all, let's have that faith. Let's keep that focus. Let's love God. Let's put him in the first of everything whenever you're ready. Y'all, I am so grateful that God loved me enough. Can I get it? If you can, if you don't have a reason, you can stand. Can we stay back to stand out of respect and honor of reading? I mean, of preaching the word of God, the prayer of God. Also, the altar is open if you feel like God's laid it on your heart. A lot of folks may want to know what the altar is here for. Let me tell you. If you've got something you've been praying about and you want to take those extra steps to come down to the altar and ask God to heal you on or whatever else, this is what it's here for. As we pray for each and every person here, Lord, for the ones that are struggling, for the ones that are hurting, Lord God, for the ones that have lost hope, desire, Lord, for those that are looking for that new dedication for you. Today, Lord God, we look brand new prayer. Asking, Lord Jesus, that for some of us that need that extra fire, that extra spunk, that extra spark. Lord God, help us to keep you as our focus. Lord, help us to stay on the right path. Lord, I pray that each and every person here puts you as number one. Lord God, let us serve you with our full heart. Let us love you. Lord God, if there's anyone here that says, Pastor, I'm not sure, but I'm not sure that I'm saved and I want to be sure. Or maybe there's some here that say I'm not or online that says I'm not saved at all and I want to be saved. Can we take this time to ask Jesus into our heart? The Bible says that if you believe that Jesus died on that cross at Calvary and rose that third day, that his blood is sufficient to wipe away all of our sins. Will you please pray with me and ask him into your heart if you're not sure? Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Wash me in the blood of Jesus and save my soul. God, I give my heart to you and I follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, as we continue to pray. Lord God, let them understand the Bible says, least you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That means not just saying we're sorry, but allowing God to help us turn to those sins. The Bible says that we shall be born again. If you truly accepted Jesus in your heart, that old man's died. And it's time for the new man to take over that new birth. I strongly suggest that you've asked Jesus into your heart. Next step, be baptized. Lord God, I ask for each and every person here that maybe have lost their spunk, their fire, their excitement. Lord, if you put this back in your heart, please, sir. Help us, the church, to do your work. Lord, help us continue to go where you have us to go. Dear sweet Jesus, we love you so much. And we thank you for all that you do. Bring us back here, Lord, if at all possible tonight. But if not, we pray that we meet together one day in the form of Lord. We don't be together on this side. We love you so much. We thank you for all that you do. Praying for all that are sick and struggling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God, come on for just a second.